Introduction Today the Church celebrates the entry of Christ into Jerusalem in order to accomplish His Paschal Mystery. This Sunday is called Palm or Passion Sunday. While Palm Sunday signifies royalty and triumph, Passion Sunday signifies both suffering and love. It is on Palm Sunday that we enter Holy Week, welcoming Jesus into our lives, and asking Him to allow us a share in His suffering, death, and resurrection. We pass from the joy of welcoming Jesus as He enters Jerusalem to the sorrow of watching Him condemned to death and then crucified. By freely going to Jerusalem, Christ demonstrates His humility and willingness to save us. This week gives us an opportunity to look at our own commitment to the truth and justice, and at our loyalty to Christ and His Gospel. Palm branches were the ancient symbol of victory. When the Roman soldiers come home from battle, they would bring with them palm branches from the conquered territory as souvenirs of their victory. For Christians the palm branches are meant to be a symbolic gesture, symbolizing the need to lay down our hearts before Jesus, allowing Him access into our inmost being. Palm branches are widely recognized symbol of peace and victory, hence their preferred use on Palm Sunday. On this day the Christian community begins to reenact a very important phase of the Paschal mystery of Jesus Christ. We reenact the triumphant entry of Christ into Jerusalem as well as His Passion. Hence today's celebration reminds us of the dual nature of our Christian lives and journey. We are celebrated today and persecuted tomorrow. Today we are loved while the next day we are hated. Today we are praised and castigated the next day. Today's first reading is taken from the Third Servant Song of Isaiah 50 verses 4 to 7. There are four passages in Isaiah that highlight a mysterious figure whose suffering brings about a benefit for the people. First, the suffering servant is sent on a mission from God. Second, the mission involves suffering on behalf of another. Third, although the servant will suffer and be rejected, he will, in the end, be exalted and vindicated. Finally, his suffering will bring justice, salvation, and blessing to all nations. Jesus saw aspects of his own life and mission foreshadowed in the servant songs, and the Church refers to them in this time of solemn meditation on the climax of Jesus' life. The second reading from Philippians 2 verses 6-11 is an ancient Christian hymn representing a very early Christian understanding of who Jesus is, and of how his mission saves us from sin and death. This reading reminds us that our Lord willingly surrendered Himself to experience suffering and humiliation for our sake. He did not cling to His divinity but became man in order to redeem men. He humbled Himself further in His humanity to be enslaved like a servant, obediently embracing suffering and death and crucifixion for our sake. The Gospel today has two parts. The first part read before the procession with palm describes the royal reception that Jesus received from his admirers. Jesus permitted such a royal procession for two reasons, one, to reveal to the general public that he was the promised Messiah, and two, to fulfill the prophecies of Zechariah, chapter 9 verse 9, and Zephaniah, chapter 3 16 verse 19 rejoice, heart and soul daughter of Zion. In the second part, we listen to Matthew's Passion Narrative. In this Passion Narrative, we are challenged to examine our own lives in the light of some of the characters in the story like Peter who denied Jesus, Judas who betrayed Jesus, Pilate who acted against his conscience, Herod who ridiculed Jesus, and the leaders of the people who preserved their position by getting rid of Jesus. As it happened with generations of Christians in the past, starting with those Christian communities to whom Matthew addressed his Gospels, this event in the life of our Lord invites us to a deeper discovery of Christ and of his role in our life. 
During this week of passion, passionate suffering, passionate grace, passionate love, and passionate forgiving, each of us is called to remember the Christ of Calvary and then to embrace and lighten the burden of the Christ whose passion continues to be experienced in the hungry, the poor, the sick, the homeless, the lonely and the outcast. Palm Sunday's glory lasted for a short time while the glory of Easter Sunday lives long eternally. During this holy week, we are called to make this journey from Palm Sunday leading up to Easter Sunday. Proper participation in the Holy Week liturgy will also deepen our relationship with God, increase our faith, and strengthen our lives as disciples of Jesus. Christ loved us to the point of dying for us. He will help us to confront and overcome the evil in ourselves, and then He will make us true instruments of His truth, justice, peace, and love in the world. Gospel Exegesis Jesus rides a donkey on Palm Sunday. The primary reason why Jesus rode a donkey on Palm Sunday was to recall the prophecy of Zechariah regarding the Messiah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem! Lo, your king comes to you! Triumphant and victorious is he! Humble and riding on an ass! On a colt the foal of an ass! Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 It was a very deliberate act that the people of Jerusalem would have recognized. Furthermore, Jesus was highlighting what kind of king he was, as Pope Benedict XVI explains in his 2006 homily on Palm Sunday. It should be remembered, John said, that in the book of the prophet Zechariah, we read, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on the colt of an ass, John 12 verse 15. To understand the significance of the prophecy and, consequently, of Jesus' behavior, we must listen to the whole of Zechariah's text, which continues thus, He shall banish the chariot from Ephraim, and the horse from Jerusalem, the warrior's bow shall be banished, and he shall proclaim peace to the nations. His dominion will be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. The second thing the prophet shows us is that this king will be a king of peace, he will cause chariots of war and war horses to vanish, and he will break bows and proclaim peace. In those days, kings used to travel in such processions on horseback during wartime but preferred to ride a donkey in times of peace. It represents the humble arrival of someone in peace, as opposed to arriving on a steed in war. Christian tradition imagines young Mary and her unborn infant riding a donkey into Bethlehem before the first Christmas. In a fitting bookend, Jesus rides a donkey into Jerusalem before the first Easter. This common pack animal carries the Savior to his birth and to his death. A. The central message contained in the narration. All four Gospels narrate the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem, and this tells us, already that it was a decisive event in his life. There is a central message the four Gospels mean to convey when narrating this event, it is a double message. 1. Jesus was the Messiah awaited by the people of Israel. During the early day of his public life, Jesus would prevent anyone who discovered what he was, from publishing it around. The time had now come to proclaim the news to everyone. Yes, he was the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the purpose of his coming was to save all of me. He had kept on saying them, right from the moment of his conception in the womb of Mary, the time had now come to complete his work through his passion and death. This is truth above all truths and as he would tell Pilate, he would witness to it to the very end. John 18, 37 Matthew says that the crowds acclaim Jesus with the words. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessings on him who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the highest heavens. Matthew 21, 9. 2. Jesus was the Messiah announced by the prophets. The episodes of the donkey, a detail Jesus arranged personally, enabled him to fulfill a prophecy of Zechariah, a minor prophecy, one would say. Yet the detail is very important, it was not one but hundreds of prophecies, every single promise God had made to the man that was fulfilled in Christ. Paul writes to his Christians of Corinth that Christ is the yes to all the promises of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20 God proved his faithfulness in Christ and proved it conclusively. b. What were the thoughts that occupied the mind of Jesus as he entered Jerusalem acclaimed by all the people? Though the four Gospels coincide in a central message conveyed by the episode of Jesus' entrance in Jerusalem, there are differences too from Gospel to Gospel in the narration. The reason for those differences is simple, each writer tried to adapt the episode to the particular needs of the Christians for whom he was writing. There is a point that Luke brings into relief, the difference between the thoughts that occupied the minds of the crowd and the thoughts filling the mind of Jesus as he rode towards Jerusalem. For the crowd, what counted was that the Messiah had at long last arrived. He would soon display his power, they thought. He would soon drive away the Romans occupying the country and re-establish the kingdom of David, this time for good. The joy of the apostles too knew no bounds. At long last, they thought, the master seemed to be giving up those awful thoughts about suffering and death he had been referring to so often during the past months. Now, his views seemed to coincide with theirs, they would not be disappointed in their ambition. How far their thoughts were from the thoughts of Jesus in those moments. In the mind of Jesus, past, present and future were one. He was determined to complete the salvation of the world no matter the cost. A particular thought weighed heavily on Jesus' heart, the thought that some people would reject the salvation he offered so generously, and be lost. It mattered little whether they would be few or many. The loss of a single person was a tragedy more than sufficient to move Jesus to tears. Luke says that at the sight of Jerusalem, Jesus wept, Luke 19, verse 41. The material destruction of that precious town would be a tragic sight indeed but only a pale symbol of the tragedy involving the loss of a single person who rejects God's love. See, Christ accepts whatever we offer in the sincerity of heart and makes use of it to save us. The thought of those who would go lost did not prevent Jesus from accepting the acclamations of the people, imperfect as they were, Jesus accepted them because they were sincerely offered. This brings us to an important consideration. When Jesus sent the two apostles to look for the donkey, he put in their lips the explanation to be given to the owner, the master needs it. Jesus added words of exquisite courtesy, he will send it back here directly, that is, the master says that he will personally take care that you recover the donkey. The master needed service from the owner of the donkey, he truly needs the service of each and every one of us. He keeps on sending daily a variety of messages with the tag, the Master needs it. What can Jesus possibly need from us? The Spirit within us will make known to us the nature of His request. Often it might appear something of no consequence, most of the time His request will take the form of some service to Him, but in the person of our neighbor. But however small, However apparently insignificant his request may be, one this is certain, the Master needs it, rather, the Master needs us. Jesus needs our daily service. We should rest assured of this one thing, no service rendered to Jesus will be ever left unreturned. He will personally see to the reward. Life Messages
1. Does Jesus weep over me? Our attitudes are not different from that of Peter, Judas, Pilate, and Herod. At most moments of our life, we deny, betray, ridicule, act against our conscience and persevere in our position in justifying evil. Before the beginning of the procession, Jesus wept over Jerusalem, Luke 19 verses 41 to 42, and when the procession was over, he cleansed the temple, Luke 19 verses 45 to 46. On the following day, he cursed a barren fig tree. Jesus cursed a fig tree for lying with its leaves. It looked good from the outside, but there was nothing there. We need to ask ourselves, does Jesus still weep over my sins? Are you ready to imitate the prodigal son and return to God, our loving Father, by confessing your sins and making a sincere and honest resolution to turn away from sin and be faithful to the gospel so as to share in his resurrection? 2. Let us be Christ-centered. Let us welcome Jesus into our hearts and into our homes. Today, we receive palm branches, let us take them to our homes and put them someplace where we can always see them. Let the palms remind us that Christ is the King of our families, that Christ is the King of our hearts, and that Christ is the only true answer to our quest for happiness and meaning in our lives. Let the experience of this holy week strengthen us in our various difficulties and challenges of life. Suffering and pain are inevitable parts of the human experience, no one wants to experience them but, many try to avoid them at all costs. But the Holy Week reminds us that it is through suffering that we enter into victory. Without the cross, there cannot be a crown. So be a strong child of God in your sufferings, and don't deny Christ because of your hard experiences because if you remain strong and faithful to Him, you will also share in His victory someday. Let us offer Christ our donkeys. If someone had not let go of his donkey who knows Jesus' entry into Jerusalem would not have been as triumphant as it was. Jesus needs our sacrifices to support the church and suffering humanity. Our little sacrificial gifts go a long way in relieving the crosses of many who are suffering. Let us be generous and kind. Let us always remember that a Christian without Christ is a contradiction in terms. Such a one betrays the Christian message. Hence, let us become active Christians during this Holy Week, enabling others to see in us Jesus' universal love, unconditional forgiveness, and sacrificial service. May the experience of the Holy Week renew and restore your faith in God. May you receive the grace to be a better child of God. May it strengthen you in moments of difficulties. May you see beyond your sufferings the victory that lies ahead. Amen.